I'm sure some of these mics are taller than me. Um, uh, Tarangi, you laughed a bit too hard there. You laughed a little bit too hard. That's too much. That's too much. Uh, but anyway, uh, church, good morning. Uh, as ever, it is so wonderful uh, to see you. Uh, we are going through a series called um, The Holiness of God. Um, I'm going to start by uh, asking you guys if you've um, heard of the TikTok trend where uh, ladies ask their partners, uh, how many times in a week do you think about the Roman Empire? Uh, so I don't know, lads, if you've been asked that question. Uh, I'm going to ask you now, how many times in a week do you guys think about the Roman Empire? Apparently, surprisingly, guys think about the Roman Empire quite a lot. I don't know what that's got to do with. So if you've got a hypothesis why that's the case, I would be interested in knowing. But it got me thinking, how many times in a week do we think about the holiness of God? I certainly think at least once a week, since we preached on it last week. So at least once a week, unless I put you to sleep. Um, I will try better this time around. Uh, but how many times in a week do we think about the holiness of God? And if you missed the preaching last week, uh, you can catch it on repeat uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, so you can, we're looking at Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, what we found in that chapter was there is a holy God and it's not you or me. So there is a holy God and it's not you or me. And there's a response. We are to repent, we are to volunteer and we are to worship. So with that, let us come to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, may you help me show your people in this room and those that are watching online, your holiness, who is sufficient for such a task. Certainly it is not me. But Father, I beg of you, may you be merciful this morning and use me as your instrument to show the beauty of your holiness to the people that are listening this morning. Help us to move from fear and worry and anxiety into trusting you, our holy God. Amen. Have you had um, a listen or a look at the headlines this week? How has that got you feeling? Maybe a little anxious, maybe a little worried, maybe a little fearful. What is going on in the world? I don't know how you get your news. Uh, maybe you are trendy and you get it via TikTok, or maybe you like it short and snappy and you get it via X that used to be called Twitter. They had a rebrand. Um, however you get your news, how, is it that, how has that got you feeling? I will tell you how I get my news. The first is intentional and the other one is not. Uh, so the first one is I get my news by the radio. I drive a lot, so the radio is on. So that's how I hear about the news. It's not that I want to hear about the news. Uh, sometimes it could be depressing, but I just am too lazy and could not be bothered to change the station. So I just listen to the same news hour after hour. But I do have an intentional way that I do keep up with the news. Don't judge me when I tell you this, but it is quite efficient. And I'm sure you guys have done it. What I do is when I go to the grocery store or I'm paying for petrol, I just walk on over to the newspaper stand and I just look there for like 10 seconds, scan the headlines, and I'm done. I haven't even touched their paper, right? So it's not cheating, right? I have not even touched their paper. I just scanned the headlines and I know what it is that is going on in the world. But as I scan the headlines, I read about what's happening in the Middle East, the conflict between Israel and Palestine. I think about the Russia-Ukraine war. I think about the recent earthquakes. I think about the pandemic 
that we've all been through. And I wonder to myself, is the world spiraling out of control? Is it only a matter of time before it is chaos? It suddenly feels like the world is spiraling out of control, that there is no one who is in charge. And when that is happening, I feel my anxiety levels rising. And, and, and the cycle usually goes like this. I have a slide for this. Uh, it's probably a little bit too small maybe for you to read, but I will tell you this uh, anxiety cycle. It's the more informed you are, the more out of control you think the world is. And the more you think that the world is out of control, the more you become fearful, anxious, and worried. And the more you become fearful, anxious, and worried, the more you start to question God's sovereignty. The more you start to question God's control. Who is in charge of this mess? And you tell yourself, no one's in charge. This is all random and it's spiraling out of control and very soon it will be World War III and it is the end of the world. And when we do go into this fear cycle, it's not pleasant. So how can we come out of this fear cycle? Suddenly we can start by maybe reading less news, maybe not staying as well informed as we need to be. Maybe you just scan those newspaper headlines and be on your way. So that will certainly help a little bit. However, even when you do not scan the headlines, it still has a way of affecting you. So even when the, what's happening in the Middle East kicked off, I thought that was happening very far away until I got a text from my mother who was on the way to Israel. She was on a cruise and on her way to Israel. And they, she was just telling me that they've just been diverted and they're not going to be there. But I wasn't looking at the news. I wasn't looking for any of that. But here I was, just about to be affected. So we've got this fear cycle that we need to handle. And to handle this cycle, we are going to go to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to hear how we can remedy living in fear, anxiety, and worry. And the answer to that is going to be in Revelation chapter 4. But before we get into Revelation chapter 4, I just have a, 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 a primer or, or proviso to say, Revelation is a very hard book. So if you find it hard to read, it's certainly a hard book to preach. So to think otherwise is to kill ourselves. And one of the reasons that makes it hard, I was going to read the verses, um, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 4, to set it up, but I think I'll just mention it to you. It's a cocktail of three genres. So three writing styles. So first of all, Revelation is a letter. It is a letter to the seven churches. So just like our normal letters, it is a letter that is conveying information. So that's the first genre that we encounter. And then the second genre that we encounter is prophecy. So it's foretelling what is to happen. And then when we're reading it, this other side of the prophecy, some of the prophecies have happened and some of them have not. And then you need to try and work out which have happened and which have not. And then the one that makes it really tough is the writing that's called apocalyptic writing. It is a writing that was popular uh, 200 AD um, to 200 BC in that time period. It is sort of like, you can almost say it is the writing of the oppressed. It is, it is a writing that is cryptic in the way of cryptic to the people who you don't want to understand the message, but clear to the people you want to hear the message. So that makes it really hard for us to decipher like 2,000 years, the other side. So I, I, I've tried my hand at apocalyptic writing, uh, and I'll, I'll see if you guys can decipher it. Some I'm sure can decipher. Uh, if you put the, the slide um, with the uh, house and the tiger. So 
Behold, I looked, and there was a green tiger with many people dancing around the tiger, happy. Do we know what the green tiger might be? The Celtic tiger. The Celtic tiger. So the Celtic tiger, this is the years between kind of like um, late 1990s to early 2000s when Ireland was booming and there was prosperity and people were prospering. So then the next part of my apocalyptic writing, and then I turned and I look again, and the tiger was slain, dying, and people were crying as the tiger was being crushed by a house. Any, any idea what's going on there? Yeah? Yeah, 2008 housing crisis, right? Housing crisis, crushing the tiger. And, and for those who understood that clearly, it's because you probably lived through that period and you understand what happened then. But for other people, that was just all gibberish, right? It's like, what on earth are they talking about? So that's a little bit of a taster of apocalyptic writing. So when we get to chapter four, Remember, it's apocalyptic writing, so we're going to need to try and work out through some things. And I'm going to highlight uh, the, the, the big things that we need to know. Because one of the other things that makes apocalyptic writing is, what do you focus on? So on this picture, yes, we want to focus on the tiger and the house, but the number of windows in the house, they don't mean anything, right? We don't need to focus on that. So as we read Revelation, it's a bit like that. There's some things that we need to hone in and focus on, and then there are some things that we just leave alone. Like, um, you know, we don't need to press the detail. So as we read Revelation chapter 4, I will hone in on the things that we need to focus on, and the other things that I don't hone in on, let's just leave them alone. They're like the windows and the doors on that house. Um, did I give a warning that today might be a little heavy? <laughs> today might be a little heavy. But this is how we get out of that fear cycle. Remember, more news, more fear, more spiraling out of control. So Revelation chapter 1, chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4. After this, I looked... So after the first vision, I looked. So this is the next vision in the sequence. Not necessarily in time or chronologically, just saying after the first vision I saw, this is the next vision that I'm going to see. So after this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So this is just depicting he was allowed to see. And the voice I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And the voice that is speaking to him is Jesus. So now we go to verse 2. At once I was in the Spirit. So the Spirit is enabling this vision. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. So this is the big thing in this chapter. The throne. And even as I read, if you can count how many times throne comes up. And I'll quiz you after I read. So, was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it? And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And then we... Go to verse 4. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and sitting, seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. So 24 elders, what are these? The 24 elders are likely angelic beings representing all the saints all the Christians over time. So Old Testament and New Testament 
believers in God. They are represented by these 24 elders. So you can say 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel. So these are representing all the saints of all time. That's the important bit. Then we move on. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and pearls of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. One thing I want to highlight there, the seven spirits of God is the Holy Spirit. That is the sevenfold um, spirit of God. This is the, 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 the only sort of like vision when you see heaven and you actually see the spirit. Mostly you're seeing the Son and the Father. But here we're seeing the, the Holy Spirit. And then we move on. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. Normally in the Bible, the sea is a place of chaos and disorder. But here before the throne, it is calm. In the center around the throne were four living creatures. And they were covered with eyes in front and in the back. The, f the first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. There's a whole lot going on there, but I will point to the big thing. The big thing is the living creatures are representing animate objects everywhere. Like when you go to Psalm 150 verse 6, it says, everything that has breath, praise the Lord, right? So, so this is the, it's representing that. And, and don't get back down in, in, in what the creatures look like, because especially if you're one of those people who read and visualize what you're reading, you're going to struggle here because you can't really visualize what's going on here. But what is really more important is what, is, what are they doing? What are the 24 elders? What are the four living creatures doing? Each of the four living creatures has six wings, and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him, who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever. The 24 elders fall down before him, who sits on the throne, and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and saying, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things. And by your will they were created and have their being. So how many times in that passage does throne come up? Oh wow. <laughs> in chapter in chapter four. In chapter four it's just eleven times. <laughs> oh wow. Man, you had me he frightened there. I was like, man, you gotta go back to school. Man, what's going on? But 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 then I just wanna go like um go back to like uh, verse eight. No? I don't know which version you got, but in my version, it's eleven. Ah. All right. We, we might need to sort this after the service. <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is, right, I, I want to bring you back to verse 8. And at this point, I just want to um, invite um, Aaron uh, to come up and just play um, a little song. Because I, I think we cannot read a passage about, uh, about worship and responding in worship and just stay silent. The thing is, in verse 8, you read, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Isn't it, haven't we heard this before? Like last week in Isaiah chapter 6, right? But, but, but you see what the Apostle John here, the writer, does? He changes the second part. So it's not uh, holy, holy, holy is the, is the Lord God Almighty, and the whole earth is full of his glory. No, he changes it, and it goes, who was and is and is to come. And, and, and this is just, the, the, the writer to the Hebrew puts it this way. 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You need to understand something. In Isaiah's time, when he saw that vision, God was in control. In our time, God is in control. And in the future, God's going to be in control. So come what may, God is holy and he's in control. And what we need to do as his people, we need to respond in worship. So I just want to sing a few lines as we respond in worship. All thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, your name stands above them all, and the angels cry, Holy, all creation cries, Holy, you will lift it high, Holy, holy forever. Hear your people sing, Holy, to the King of Kings, Holy. You will always be holy, holy forever. You will always be holy, holy forever. You will always be. Holy, holy forever. You will always be holy, holy forever. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are holy. There is none like you. Father, when the world feels like it is spiraling out of control, it is not out of control. Father, you are enthroned on high. You are in charge of the things that are happening on this earth. All earthly affairs are under your dominion. You're not falling. You have not fallen asleep at the wheel. Father, you know what you're doing. And as your people, we want to praise you. We want to trust you, even sometimes when we do not know what is happening. We thank you, Lord, because you're holy. Amen. Aaron, thank you so much for that. Uh, when I do meet God, I was like, oh, God, I love to sing so much, but you gave me a voice that cannot sing. They tell me that if I go to a voice coach, that I could maybe sing a little bit, but I don't know if that's true. I think that's just to try and, uh, you know, keep me from getting dejected because I do love to, to, to worship. But if you ever stand before me, you know that verse that says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. That is me. That is me. So we want to respond in worship, but worship has two senses. Two senses. There is just what we have done. It's bowing our hearts and singing with our mouths and saying, God is holy. And we want to worship him as we join heaven. But there is another sense in which we to worship. And, and, and just give me a moment here as I try to bring it out, uh, what this other sense is. So in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, you read this. Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now and what will take place later. So now we ask, what is it that's going to take place later? What are these visions telling us? And we catch a glimpse of it in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9. Some of the things that are going to happen at these. In, in, let, let me back up a little bit. After Revelation chapter 4, we go to Revelation chapter 5. We'll touch on it in about two weeks' time. But there is a scroll that is sealed, 
and no one is worthy to open the scroll. And John the writer starts to weep. And as he weeps, why is he weeping? Because no one is able to unseal the scroll. But then he's told about the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God who was slain, who then opens the scroll. And then when these seals one by one are being opened, we get to the fifth seal, and this is what you read in Revelation 6, 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told, Wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. So in summary, part of the vision is saying, you're going to be persecuted. To the local churches, you are going to suffer for the sake of Christ. But I'm giving you visions, chapter 4 and chapter 5, so that you do not think God is still not in control. Because you see, there is something about when suffering and hardship and affliction comes that makes us think that God is not in control. Especially persecution. There is part of me that says, maybe, maybe I can take suffering. Maybe, maybe I can take some hardship. Uh, maybe I can take things in this life. But persecution? Suffering because you're a Christian. That doesn't seem right. When that happens, there is something in us that says, no, 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 no. My God will not allow this. He must not be in control. He must not have the power to change what is happening. But chapters 4 and 5 tell us that God is in control even of our suffering. We might not understand it, but we're to trust him who's in control. And by the way, persecution comes in all shapes and sizes. There are some that are being imprisoned for their faith. There are some that are suddenly getting killed for their faith. But maybe for you and me, it is the exclusion from our family. Or even those slight remarks from your friends when you come along, maybe even just for a dinner party. And they're like, oh, these Holy Joe and Holy Jane... We can't do anything fun now because they're here. Yes, they're doing it all in banter, but it hurts. It is a form of persecution because of your faith. And in those moments, we wonder is God is, if God is in control. Or when you hear what is happening in the Middle East or the pandemic strikes, you do wonder is God in control. But if there is one point and one point only that I want to make it is this. Whatever is happening or may happen, continue to worship because a holy God is still in control of all its affairs. Continue to worship in the two senses, singing out to God and living your life in a way that is pleasing to him, being faithful to him. Yes, you might not understand it, but you are to trust him. I have a picture that's going to come up here. Uh, what is that? Do we know what that is? Formula One race. Um, um, yeah. Ah, it's actually a checkers board. Uh, it's a checkers board. Uh, and um, growing up, I used to love checkers. Uh, we, we didn't call it checkers. We called it drafts. And uh, we used to play it with... Um, you know, if you come from Africa, on the next slide, we used to play it with, like, border tops, you know, because we, we couldn't uh, afford to kind of buy stuff, so we would make up and we would play our border tops. But I loved it, although I was horrible at it. I lost all the time, but I, but I loved it. 
But one of the things that I loved about it is there is order and the rules are very simple. Like the, 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 the border top can only move one square diagonally. It cannot go backwards. It cannot go sideways. It just moves diagonally. Except when you're sort of like eliminating an opponent, then you can move two steps. But it is simple. But can you imagine my shock the first time I saw a chessboard? The chaos, <laughs> the disorder. I'm telling you, there was one piece that can move in all directions. There was one piece that could kind of jump on top of other pieces in an L shape. There was one piece that would just go diagonally this way. It was all out of control. But I know I say it in jest, but was it out of control? It was not. I just did not understand it. But it was not out of control. And then when you watch these chess players, sometimes they will let their pieces get eliminated off the board. Because in five, six moves time, they're going to have the other person on checkmate. But when you're watching with an untrained eye, it's chaos. Why are you letting your piece be taken? But that is how the checkmate is going to happen. And sometimes I wonder when it comes to God, do we analyze God at the checkers level? So when there are things that we do not understand, we say it's chaos. But it's not chaos. God's not playing checkers. He's playing chess. And chess at another level. So when things come along that you do not understand, just remember this. You are trying to analyze God using rules that work for checkers and drafts. But God is doing something totally different. So what you need to understand is you got to trust God. In Numbers it says this. God is not human that he should lie. No, a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and though not act? Does he not promise and not fulfill? So we need to trust God even when we don't know everything that is happening. And that's going to be our remedy for now being fearful, anxious, and worried. That's how we snap out of that fear cycle. And we actually live lives, as Romans 12 verse 1 tells us, that are living and acceptable to God. That is our proper worship. So again, as you this week are no doubt going to come through a lot of headlines, a lot of news, especially when he has stuff to do with what's happening in the Middle East, the secular commentators will tell you, this is the beginning of World War III. Because when this happened, that's going to happen, and that person's going to retaliate, and that's going to draw this person in. And before you know it, it is World War III. And when you go to the Christian commentators, I don't know if they're any better, they're predicting the end of the world. This is a sign that it's going to be the end of the world, and I can tell you it's the end of the world. Maybe they are right. Maybe they are not. I don't know. But all I know is whatever is happening or is going to happen, Continue to worship a holy God because he's still in control of earth's affairs. And I'm going to leave you with this little snippet that um, C.S. Lewis wrote to his contemporaries. Uh, it's called Living in the Time of the Atomic Bomb. So living in the time of the atomic bomb. Like if you can Google it and kind of read the whole thing, it's nice. But he essentially says, in one way, we think a great deal too much about the atomic bomb. How are we to live in the age of the atomic bomb? I'm tempted to reply. Why? As we would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year. As you have lived in the Viking age when the raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night. Or indeed, as you already are living in an age of cancer, syphilis, Paralysis, air raids, railway accidents, the age of Morocco accident. There is always something happening or going to happen. 
But this is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken to pull ourselves together. We are all going to be destroyed by the... If we are all going to be destroyed by the atomic bomb, or you can put World War Three in there, whatever it is, let the atomic bomb find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting with our friends, over a pint and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, but they are not to dominate our minds. You see, we are not meant to live in cycles of fear because God is holy and in control. I just want to invite the music team to come back up. Um, if that was heavy, wait until two weeks' time. <laughs> just, just messing, just messing. Uh, let us pray. Dear Mighty Father, we do thank you that you are a God in control, a God who sees everything, and a God who is playing chess. Help us to trust you, even when we don't know what is happening, even when we cannot work it out. Help us to trust that you are holy and holy forever, the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Amen.